in Nederland te praten. Ja. Maar ik kan het niet goed. Maybe I just can only check something for me. Silver. Yeah. I just needed to check whether the video was working. Thank <laughs> you. 
your master thesis. <coughs> and uh, at this uh, thing, you talk more of the form of injury, mm -hmm. which uh, injury you choose. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I, I find it very interesting because the data you have collected. Um, and I spoke about it, uh, about the data I found in, from Germany. Mm -hmm. I have 200 uh, side um, mm -hmm. report of sports mm -hmm. injury in basketball, mm -hmm. yeah. handball, football, and ice hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, about the two um, upper leagues mm -hmm. um, broke bro mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And um, I'm so myself uh, coming from Apple, mm -hmm. played over 22 years, mm -hmm. and I've never seen something mm -hmm. like um, like like an intention to prevent injuries. They always happen, mm -hmm. but nobody cares about it, and nobody uses it against mm -hmm. something. Factors. 
So Marta is in the other room? Another password, Maria. Hmm? You know the password? Password? Yes, I go to here to check the guest. The guest? The guest English? Do you see the papers that we're here? Hmm? Ah. The papers. No, the salon is not a gent to cook. I don't know if Parece que se posta para a mesma esta. Tem lógica, não é? Azul de. 
You're the first speaker. Okay. I think so. Okay. <laughs> we will make you first, don't worry. For me. No. You know the passport here? Then maybe it says something about this? No, 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 no. Uh, Try handball for health. <laughs> no? Maybe. Uh, no, no. Oh, what's yeah, this? this is, no, yeah. this is a number. Uh, this must be the This must be Is there a port? No, it's a port. It will be the has two yes. talks. Yes. And then I have another. Do you want to give them one after the other? No. no? You want to rest, relax, I want to relax. recover. Because <laughs> my my set wall. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, it's fine. It's okay. Don't worry. You stay. You will get this. Do you prefer? Yeah, I think it's easier. Alright, so we're back after, uh, after the break and uh, our first talk for uh, this last session uh, of the day is um, by Luis Gonzaga from Portugal um, talking about coaches emotional skills and interpositional behaviors in sports coaching. A very short title. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, all, all coaches. I salute you. Um, this is my presentation. I, I will have more text than I, than I speak because I'm Portuguese uh, and my English is not so good. I, uh, I'll try to communicate to, with you. Coaches' emotional skills and uh, uh, interpersonal behavior are crossing two teams emotions and motivation intrinsic motivation I will show it if this in um, sports training research we have uh, now three motion three, three, three moments in the first moment, uh, we have focused a lot in behavioral, behavior, coach behavior. It was the behaviorism tradition. 
um, cognitive uh, variables uh, appear in the 50s, in 60s. Um, they have, we, we have studied uh, both separately and uh, we cross both uh, variables um, more recently. The new focus now is uh, investigating the role of emotions in sport. Um, practically, the, 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 the role of emotion in sport are a study uh, thinking about emotional of player, uh, player emotions, uh, difficulting the, the, the performance. So we study now in this uh, work, uh, we try to think about coaches' emotions, coaches' emotional skills. The new tendencies um, in the positive um, approach uh, is uh, coaching social and emotional skills in youth players. So we think, what about coaches' skills to lead, to, to, to regulate, to, to utilize, utilize uh, their own emotions? According to the coaching's interpersonal behaviors um, are related to players' motivation. Here, the player's motivation, according to, to this uh, theory, maybe you, you know it, um, thinks about uh, uh, coach's behavior as uh, a promotion or a controlling or thwarting player's psychological needs. Player's psychological needs, according to this theory, are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So we think about motivation or player's motivation. We must think about the, um, the relationship established between coaches and uh, his, their players. Competence, autonomy, relatedness, a small concept, uh, small definitions, or short definitions, sorry. The proposal of our study is uh, measure self-related self -related coaches' emotional skills, a perception by yourself, by, by themselves, the measure their percep to measure their perception about their own uh, interpersonal behaviors, and uh, the relationships between uh, emotional and behavioral emotions, uh, behavioral variables, sorry. Uh, our methodology are two questionnaires, uh, self-responded. We have uh, 51 participants, all handball coaches. The most uh, are male. Their ages are an average of uh, 43 years, and uh, their handball training experience are 16 years, fifth, uh, 16 and a half years. Um, most of them training male teams, and uh, a particular data, uh, 36, almost uh, 71 percent completed universal university courses or are attending higher education. This is a profile of the, the coach, the handball coaches we have in Portugal more and more. Are qualifying, academic qualifying um, coaches. The, the, the two questionnaires we use, the emotional intelligence scale, the version for sport, we measured six dimensions, self-emotional knowledge, uh, social awareness and empathy, emotional regulation, 
social skills by managing others' emotions, utilization uh, of emotions, and optimism. Um, five point Likert scale, like this, a little press. The other questionnaire are the interpersonal behaviors questionnaire in sport, the version in sport, 20, 24 items. There are three pairs of uh, autonomy, supportive, and thwarting. You have here uh, a little uh, uh, example of uh, the items. Competence, relatedness, supportive, and thwarting um, both. We use the self form to evaluate uh, um, coaches in the interpersonal behavior when they coach their players. Results. We have um, a first result. Uh, and ball coaches perceive themselves as, as globally emotional competent. The at optimism is the most powerful uh, strength they perceive. The awareness and appraisal of others' emotion and utilization of own emotions constitute the weakest points, the weakest points here and here. Participants perceive their behavior as um, particularly focused on promoting the competence of their players. If we see here, we could see a mean, a higher mean. That's uh, what it said. Uh, promoting the competence of their players by his own behavior. And strictly denying constituting a uh, difficult to a proper and caring interpersonal relationship, relationship and relatedness here, uh, very small medium. The more the coaches perceive themselves as competent, crossing uh, variables, uh, the more they perceive as competent in social awareness and empathy, the less the intentional competence thwarting behavior. They don't uh, control, only alert players to the possibility of failure in the future. The more the coach's level of qualification, the more supportive behavior, behaviors to autonomy. We saw the more qualification, more they trust in their behavior and promote competence and autonomy to their own uh, players. The study provides some productive starts about the role of emotions in sport training. It is possible to link perception, regulation, and utilization of emotions by coaches to their supportive, rather than thwarting, uh, supportive behaviors in training or comp competition, developing uh, players' intrinsic, intrinsic motivation. Our study adds comprehensive evidence to higher qualified, uh, qualified coaches, level three and level four, to promote uh, handball's players' autonomy and feeling of competence. The more they are qualified, the more they promote autonomy and competence. And suggest uh, Coach educational programs need to include emotional skills training. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? I, I actually have a question. Any, anyone? I have a question. So. Um, how, how does this translate into, um, how does the coach's perception translate into <coughs> performance and to other uh, aspects? There is recent data on um, the importance of 
a coach's approach on, for instance, injuries in um, in sports. Uh, there's a big, big uh, debate on implementing new strategies and so on. Um, and and the other question is, uh, have you or are you planning to um, uh, look at the players' angle on how they perceive their coaches' uh, emotional skills? Because that would be the the real interesting. I don't understand the the. Um, so uh, the coaches' uh, approach um, and uh, um, emotional skills uh, have been shown to uh, uh, be important in uh, terms of implementing uh, injury prevention strategies and also showing less or more injuries depending on uh, how they uh, accept um, injury prevention strategies Had been, has been shown in football. We have been thinking injuries prevention. We think it uh, in a pedagogical approach to the relationship uh, coach uh, athlete. Coach as a role model, coach as an instructor, and uh, coach knowing, aware about uh, the um, consequences of his own behavior in the athletes. The emotional skills bring to us, to, to, to them, the um, awareness about uh, the, um, how to promote consequence, uh, sorry, about promote competence or autonomy in their athletes. And this is for uh, a, gen a general um, approach about uh, about uh, injuries prevention I, I, we don't think about uh, because co uh, promoting competence or promoting uh, uh, autonomy is promoting a competence or in an autonomy in technical tactical um, everything which is about uh, the, the the performance of Yes, no, 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 that's the other. We have yet uh, a small um, sample of coaches. We are um, increase this uh, uh, size of the uh, sample. And uh, after we are, we are going to question the coach, the, the players about his uh, coaching uh, behaviors. Yeah, I think that's an important uh, Sorry. aspect. Right? Not about it. Okay, so um, Luis is going to take a break and he's going to um, uh, join us again after this next talk. The next speaker is Bartosz Slowinski, talking about decision making versus age and seniority of refereeing in different level of formal competence in handball. So another short title. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bartosz Słowiński. I work in uh, Polish Handball Federation. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, coaches education. Uh, I was a player, uh, I was a referee, and uh, now I am a delegate, uh, that's why um, this kind of uh, subject. Uh, today I would like to present just a, so, uh, just a uh, short, uh, just a piece of my researches, uh, because we have only 10 minutes, so uh, I will try to do it uh, very fast. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I can skip this <laughs> this uh, introduction. Um, scientists from various fields of uh, science try to identify the factors uh, which impact uh, on referee's decision by reflecting on the topics uh, like stress and emotion, social pressures, uh, also gender. Uh, but the key issue. Um, 
should be to try to find the factors which influence the accuracy of decisions made by referees. Uh, a few study, studies uh, evaluate the work of referees, uh, for example, basketball, rugby, or uh, ice hockey. Uh, decisions made by uh, referees uh, have become an increasingly numerous uh, subject of scientific analysis uh, over the last decade, but mainly by uh, psychologists and uh, physiologists. Few researchers uh, confront referees' decision uh, with their impact of the game, while the uh, accuracy, the uh, rightness of decision, uh, is an indefinite problem in scientific research. Uh, for this reason, uh, this study uh, proposes to fill the specific knowledge gaps. Uh, so the aim of the uh, of this study was to determine the level of accuracy of decisions made by handball referees of different level of formal competence and their relationship with the age and experience of referees. Uh, characteristics of the tested persons. Uh, it was a, a random selection was made uh, consisting 50% of the population at each of the three uh, levels of uh, competitions. That is uh, 22 referees at the Super League level, uh, 34 referees at the First League level, uh, 16 uh, referees at the second level. Uh, this table presents uh, characteristics of, uh, of the tested uh, persons. Um, despite the, the fact that the referees uh, of Super League and uh, First League are also uh, allowed to lead uh, lower uh, level uh, matches, in this study the uh, analysis was based only on the matches in which uh, Super League referees uh, lead the Super League matches. Uh, also, the, the first league referees lead the first league matches and, and etc. The same situation in the second league referees. Uh, the research uh, material consists uh, of numerical data obtained by registering 10,193 decisions made by league referees during uh, two seasons. So it was quite a lot, uh, quite a lot works also. Uh, the method used in this study is a categorized observation of digital recording of league matches made on the basis of research tool uh, in the form of worksheet uh, registra uh, for uh, registering decisions. Research tool. Uh, it was uh, it was observation worksheet. It contains a catalog catalog of 132 matches situation, uh, which were evaluated as right decisions, uh, wrong decisions, and uh, lack of reaction to violation of uh, of game rules. So the catalog contained uh, 132 uh, situations that can uh, that can happen during the the handball match matches. Uh, I used a, a non-parametric uh, Kruskal-Willis test, uh, which uh, determined the level of significance of differences between. Uh, numerical values uh, describing the quality of referees' decisions uh, at the different level of, uh, of competence. I, I also use the Spearman's rank correlation to identify the most important uh, factors. Uh, results. Uh, Analyzing the level of difference, differentiation of values, describing the uh, number of uh, particular types of decisions in the analyzed groups of referees. Uh, on the basis of the data and the uh, results of the 
Dr. Scalwallis test showed that the average uh, average number of right decisions made by referees, uh, Super League referees and the First League uh, referees was significantly higher uh, than the value uh, characterizing uh, Second League referees decision. Mm. There are also significant differences in the uh, classification of wrong decisions and lack of uh, reaction. Uh, if we look at the number of decisions, we can see that the referees of the second division, the, the lowest one, uh, made the, the most decisions. Uh, Actually, it was like more, more than 25% uh, more decisions in the match uh, than the uh, Super League referees. So we can see that uh, we can we can say that uh, a higher level of the league matches determines the uh, lower number of decisions made by referees in in general. Uh, this. This is confirmed, uh, confirmed by other studies uh, in uh, basketball or also in, in football. <coughs> uh, we, we can ask, uh, is it, is it uh, satisfactory? Uh, why it is so low? So um, it's hard to say, but uh, well, we should uh, pay attention to, to the specific uh, specific character of the registration sheet, uh, which uh, contains 132 uh, possible match uh, situations. So it was very, very, uh, very huge, huge, uh, huge tool. Uh, analyzing the values of Spearman's uh, rank factors, reflecting the strength and uh, direction of the relation between quantitative features and the level of differentiation of the types of decisions, uh, according to uh, Gildorf classification, it was found that uh, there is a significant average uh, average positive correlation between the age of the referees and the number of right decisions made by referees during the match. Uh, we can say that there is a significant average negative correlation between the age of the referees and the number of wrong decisions uh, and also uh, the lack of uh, reaction. We can also see that uh, there is a, a significant average positive correlation between the referee's experience and the number of all right decisions. Uh, in the end, we can, also, uh, we can also say that there is a significant high negative correlation between the referee's experience and the number of wrong decisions and, uh, and also lack of reaction. So actually, it's obvious, but uh, I check it. <laughs> okay, conclusions. Um, uh, the results of the anal analysis of empirical data presented in this presentation uh, have expanded the existing knowledge in the research area by characterizing the structure of the quality and uh, quality of decisions made by referees. Mm, the conducted re research, interpretation, and evaluation of the results do not exhaust the whole issue of the uh, quality of the referee's work. Uh, therefore, it is uh, advisable to continue this, uh, ex uh, continue and expand the range of scientific consideration in this area. Okay, in a short way. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Bartosz. Um, next speaker, um, you might recognize him because he just gave a talk earlier this session, Luis Gonzaga. 
It's going to talk about um, psychometric pro properties and factor structure of the coach's behavior towards referees and fair play uh, scale. Please. When we talk about uh, fair play, uh, we think about uh, some players, famous celebrity champions or less known competitors, who lived the, the spirit of fair play because the media bring us the, the images of uh, small head gestures or had to act of uh, kindness um, like this one. Here we can think about uh, injuries because uh, injuries brings to player um, weakest position and it's, it's easy to help him. We can think about this later. Um, small gestures of fair play. They are roles, role models of fair play. So, if you think about it, we could, uh, um, we can see what we could to do to build a better world, to build a fair world in, with integrity, with fairness, with respect. Um, and so on. Coaches and players are related because there is handball and uh, coaches training players in handball and uh, coaches are educated uh, about handball. Handball has the rules as rules laws and regulations who in field um, officiating this the referees so we think the referees represent the rules the regulations uh, in coaches and players so what is the relation what is the the, the way Coaches respect referees or see re referees and uh, teach players see or related with referees. So we think to construct, to elaborate in scale, uh, uh, a scale, a scale uh, uh, questionnaire to measure these behaviors, promoting fair play. Uh, to, to players um, teaching what is fair play. How coaches promote fair play uh, in players. So, in a pedagogical approach, there is a culture of fair play and it, it, we want to know how to teach fair play. So, we find two uh, ways of approach, uh, seeing coach as a role model and coach as an instructor, teaching how to, and how to. The participants of this study are 137 uh, coaches, most male, um, their ages youngest than the, the, the sample anterior and um, six years of experience. So uh, coaches in, with the uh, kids, most of them. And while training coaches uh, uh, coaching male teams, the most 
70%, 71%, um, and 95 coaches, about the 70, I said before, um, completed the university courses or um, attending higher education. This uh, part of my communication here, uh, it's, it's about uh, like the, 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 my president, <laughs> Uh, it's about the, the statistical procedure to elaborate a questionnaire with um, some factors measured. So we have some kind of, uh, of um, information about it is possible with this make, make an exploratory factor analysis and uh, when we explore using Massimo Likewood, uh, our first solution was to create a six-factor scale. Um, a six-factor scale, but we have to, to do a, a parallel, a parallel analysis, analysis to introduce the 17 statements of behavior um, and uh, the size number, the size, uh, uh, so, sorry, the sample size, um, 137. And um, this eigenvalue Mo Monte Carlo uh, simulation gave us a solution with four factors. So, the four factors uh, solution are this. That's uh, maybe what is more interesting, interesting for you. Six, uh, four factors. A uh, uh, first factor with uh, five items. This is the item most uh, uh, loaded in factor. We call them, um, call him commitment to rules, referees, and uh, opponents. The commitment of the uh, coach with rules, regulations, and uh, the other agents in sport, in, in game. Uh, two, uh, two fact, uh, this is the, the most loaded, explain 14% of the results, the variance of results. Um, the second factor, promote respect to the referee's role. Not the person of the referee, but the role of referee. We have some kind of, of um, statements here. Um, invite my players to assume the role of referee. That's the, the, uh, the st a statement of uh, the coaches, how to promote uh, fair play. The third uh, factor, advise the passive acceptance of referee's decision. Passive acceptance of referee, uh, referee's decisions. And the, the final uh, factor, the weakest, uh, fair play devaluation by coaches. Coaches say they didn't uh, um, do, they don't, uh, uh, sorry, they don't know, they don't do nothing to promote fair play. A uh, graphic presentation to more visual. Uh, factor one and factor four, we see um, a coach as a role model. His behavior is an illustrate to what he wants to transmit to their players. And coach, as an instructor, they say, they, uh, they, the coaches, they say, they advise, they instruct how to, to uh, their players. Promote respect to the referee's role and advise the passive, passive acceptance to referees, uh, uh, of ref referee's decisions. Not this one. A profile of this uh, uh, sample 
the profile of, of results show us that um, these coaches, 35% are of this behavior, are commitment to rules, referees, and opponents. Uh, this is the most valued factor, as, uh, as I show. Promote respect to, for the referee's role. Advise the passive acceptance to referee's uh, decisions. This is the weakest uh, factor, as I showed them. Um, the, fact, the, the fair play devaluation. So, the profile of coaches' behavior, as I showed before, Coaches promote commitment, uh, the most commitment to the rules and the referees and the opponents. Promotes respect for the referee's role. Advise the passive acceptance to their decisions. What we want to do, we want to, we must. Uh, according to the results uh, we have uh, now, we must uh, increase our sample. We must increase reliability of the dimensions. We must, uh, and we want to compare coach qualification levels. Level one uh, with the master coach and compare and see if the, the, the the way they promote fair play is the is comparable. Compare, for example, uh, the geographical factors. For example, Portugal, France, Germany. Test the gender factor. In this sample, we have a few women coaches. Women. Um, we must uh, increase that number to compare compares coaching, for example, teams. Coaches, we, we, we train teams or national selections, if it is comparable. And uh, one factor, it seems important in this, if, is uh, if coach were uh, or is a former player. Thank you very much. Any questions? Luis, thank you for this, these interesting uh, projects and insights into the world of coaches. I think it's very important and there's lots of work to be done in this, in this area. Um, like to invite the next speaker, Yvonne Carniero, who's going to talk to us about the physiological demands of five on five indoor and outdoor recreational team handball matches for inactive over 60 year old men. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne Carneiro. Uh, I am a PhD student and I am here to present our study entitled uh, Physiological Demands of Five Against Five Indoor and Outdoor Recreational Team and Ball Matches uh, for Inactive uh, Six-Year-Old Men. Uh, this uh, study is a part of the Handball for Health project that uh, the, it was presented yesterday uh, for Susanna, and um, yeah, I'm going to explain a bit uh, the, the point <laughs> of the of the man. Okay, to contextualize, I will explain you how this started, uh, what is the background of this study, and so uh, as you all know, physical activity has wide range health benefits. Um, prevents or delays several chronic conditions uh, and it is a significant predictor of all cause and cardiovascular mortality. Uh, however, we also know that uh, it is uh, physical inactivity is responsible for 
uh, 5.3 million deaths per year worldwide. Uh, it is considered one of the most important public health problems from the 21st century. And a third of the adults uh, worldwide do not reach the recommended guidelines for physical activity. Uh, additionally, lack of motivation is the major cause of sedentary, sedentary behavior in adulthood. And uh, the, the existing options for exercise are not always attractive enough for every population and every interest. Uh, so, um, a population that is clearly affected by the lack of, uh, of physical activity are middle-aged and older men that with the aging process started to have excessive body weight uh, to, due to the increased body fat, have uh, less healthier behaviors, they have less physiological and functional status, have higher rates of most chronic diseases and uh, higher healthcare costs. And when compared to women with the same age, they are harder to engage in lifestyle changes. Uh, so. Our goal is to find uh, new types of exercise that can assure population's interests while meeting the physical activity guidelines. Uh, as we said yesterday, uh, we are trying to combine an exercise program uh, with the strength force and um, uh, balance and uh, flexibility and uh, resistance training. So we have already some proofs from recreational football. Uh, it is a very good example with many proofs of the benefits of, of in different uh, age groups and populations. As you can see, some meta-analysis here. Uh, and uh, now other team sports are being studied as well. And so we moved on to the recreational team handball. Um, the physical and physiological demands have been shown to be uh, high for adults, uh, for ad untrained adults, men uh, with prior experience in this sport, uh, with average heart rates of 82% uh, of maximal heart rate and 24% uh, of the total time spent above 90% of maximal heart rate. Um, and then we have also in, in, this, in the same uh, project and study. Uh, found some benefits in the physical fitness and cardiovascular and metabolic health with the same population, so an untrained man but with prior experience. Now we have also the untrained, um, untrained woman and adult woman and uh, some benefits have been found as well. So we don't have, um, uh, to the best of our, of our knowledge, we don't know what happens with older people with the same exercise mode, and that's what we're, we're trying to research. So the purpose of this study is to analyze the physiological demands of this exercise mode played as five against five matches in the indoor and outdoor team and ball courts for over 60 year old inactive men and with no experience with the sport. Uh, the participants were 22, and uh, the mean age was 68 years, um, 79 kilos, and 27.8% uh, of fat mass. And for this analysis, we used two indoor and two outdoor five against five recreational team handball matches. Uh, the space for each participant was 80 meters per player. Uh, all matches were divided into three 15 minute, minute periods interspected by two minute, uh, minute breaks. Uh, the outdoor matches were held under ne natural temperatures and immediate conditions. Uh, and I think it's important to highlight here that uh, recreational team handball matches for this population is a team handball adapted to the age, so we don't have contact and uh, we have uh, a different ball for them to play that uh, is a soft ball that we yesterday discovered. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, to measure the internal load, we, we measure heart rate with heart rate monitors, also blood lactate, and we use the Borg uh, RPE scale. Uh, to the external load, we use global position system, so GPS, 
And um, we actually measure the fun levels with a visual analogical scale. Uh, so let's see the results. So if we look at the results, we can see we had uh, no significant differences in mean heart rate or peak heart rate. Um, also in time above 80%, we can't see any significant differences, uh, as well as in the other all variables. Uh, we can see attendances to higher values in the RPE in the, in the indoor court, comparing with the outdoor. And the possible explanation could be related to the, the time spent above 80% that is higher in the, in the indoor courts, um, and the, the higher blood lactate values can be also an explanation. Um, but here we believe it's important to highlight the fun levels in both courts, which is 9.1. Uh, so they have uh, in zero to ten scales. So they have a lot of fun, even if they are playing indoor or outdoor uh, courts. So to conclude, I would like to say that uh, recreational team handball played has five against five is an intermittent high intensity fun exercise mode. Uh, when if you can look at the results I have shown before, and it has a potential uh, potential to induce. Uh, positive effects on the cardiovascular health for this population that has no experience with the sport, uh, regardless it's been played in the indoor or the outdoor courts. So that's all for today, if you have any questions. Age of these people is uh, very interesting. So normally these people sometimes have parallel some disease. You see about this sometimes big pressure, something else, and uh, non-stability sometimes. You know about this because you have 22 people in experiment, in your experience, and uh, any diseases. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, what is the shortest period you've noticed a substantial significant effect in their uh, physiologic parameters uh, of improvement after initiation of the program and then 16 weeks later um, but we have not measured yet the one year later, or so we only have the measures from 16 weeks later. From, from the data that your group has collected, um, have you seen um, earlier changes than 16 weeks to show Im uh, improvement in these parameters? Uh, no, we have we have uh, with a woman. We are analyzing w with uh, Rita's um, data from uh, also 16 weeks, right? So, yeah, we don't have earlier results, and we can't not see any any result yet. Before the 16 weeks, no. <laughs> yes. I would expect this is why I asked this because
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. I, I have no doubt that uh, the uh, the difference, a significant difference, can be note, noted even earlier. Yeah, four weeks, six weeks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, moving on, but staying on the same uh, topic, um, Therese Hornstrup is going to talk to us about team handball training in uh, overweight, untrained women, no need for prior experience to improve physiological parameters. Will the pointer work? Now it will. Okay. Nothing happens, I think. Don't worry, take your time, it's yeah, yeah. no pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so change in plans uh, for technical reasons. So uh, the IT uh, team will work with Teresa in the meantime and uh, uh, the next speaker will be Rita Pereira talking about recreational team handball has positive effects on bone health, body composition and physical fitness of inactive postmenopausal women. There is a competition uh, on the longest title so it's very <laughs> close in the meantime. So, good morning everyone. My name is Rita Preda. Thank you for coming. I'm here to present our work about the effects of recreational team handball in bone health, body composition and physical fitness of inactive postmenopausal women. This is part of Handball for Health project. Menopause is a permanent condition in women's life and is characterized by several hormonal changes, mainly related with the decrease of estrogen levels. Estrogens play an important role in the organism balance and it decrease is related with the first adverse effects in health, um, for example in body composition, cardiovascular and bone health, metabolic health, inflammatory status, cognitive function and others. 
exercise has proven to have uh, uh, a positive effect in decreasing body uh, mass and body fat and also to increase bo bone health bone uh, sorry uh, bone mass and lean mass and also to improve physical fitness and uh, uh, functional capacity but new types of exercise uh, sorry again <laughs> despite the effectiveness of uh, the um, conventional modes of exercise such as aerobic strength and combined exercise training new types of exercise should be considered a short term I need uh, assistance here no ah. okay okay Thank you. A short term intervention using floorball for the ones that don't know what it is, is a kind of uh, floor hockey with shoes and plastic sticks and uh, balls. And it was played for um, 12 weeks, two times per week. And it showed positive effects in uh, body composition, bone health, cardiovascular health, lipid profile, inflammatory markers, and physical fitness of postmenopausal women suggesting us that other types of exercise using team sports could also be effective in this population. Recreational team handball uh, practice effects have already been tested in adult men and women, showing encouraging results, though being still understudied in postmenopausal women. This study aimed to analyze the effect of a short recreational team handball-based program on bone health, body composition, and physical fitness of inactive postmenopausal women. For this, 68 postmenopausal women were with a mean age of 68 years were randomly allocated in team handball group and a control group. Team handball group performed 16 weeks of recreational team handball, while control, control group was instructed to keep their usual daily activity. The program consisted of two to three uh, sessions weekly of uh, 16 minutes. Um, the, each session was composed by a standardized warm-up and the three 15 minute periods of recreational team handball played as small-sided games. Heart rate was assessed in all training sessions. Uh, participants were evaluated at the beginning at the, and at the end of the 16-week exercise, exercise intervention. Body mass and height was measured uh, by a digital scale and a portable stadiometer, and fat mass, bone mineral density, and content were measured by a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. All measures follow uh, standardized protocols. Regarding to physical fitness, uh, namely strength, agility, and flexibility, uh, they were assessed by the Rickley and Jones battery tests. Balance uh, was measured by a single leg flamingo test, when each participant should stand in the dominant leg on a bar during one minute, and the number of, of falls were recorded. Results, uh, results are present as mean, baseline differences and intervention effects were analyzed using a two-way repeated measure ANOVA. The participants' mean attendance was 1.9 sessions per week, which correspond to 31 uh, sessions of uh, the 48 total training sessions. The mean heart rate was uh, 76 of heart rate max, percent of heart rate max, with peak values of 88% of heart rate max, and for 44% of total um, match uh, duration, the heart rate was above 80% of heart rate max. As you can see, it's similar what uh, was reported before for men of the same age playing the same program. Um, a time effect was shown for body mass, body fat, and lean mass. Team and ball group increase, uh, sorry, decrease body fat by 1.5%, and both groups decrease uh, body fat by 2.5% uh, to the team and ball group and 1.7% for the control group. And no changes were observed for the lean mass uh, in control group and also in um, team and ball group. Regarding to bone health, um, it was shown an interaction effect in lumbar spine bone mineral density and content, and the time effect for hip bone mineral content. 
Team and ball group increase both lumbar spine bone mineral density and content by 1.5 and 2.3 percent uh, respectively and also increase hip bone mineral content by 2.2 percent. Uh, nothing was uh, observed for hip bone mineral density and no changes were, were observed for the control group. Regarding to physical fitness, a time if at time and also group effect was shown for strength upper and lower body, and also a interaction effect was shown for strength lower body, and the time effect was shown for the flexibility, also uh, both um, upper and lower body. Team handball group increased the strength upper and lower body by 18 and uh, 26 percent. And uh, after 16 weeks, uh, team handball group show a significant higher strength than the control group. For flexibility, team handball group also uh, increased flexibility in both uh, upper and lower body by 4 and 3 centimeters, and uh, no differences for the control group. For uh, agility and balance, uh, it was shown a time effect and also a group effect uh, just for agility. Team and wall group increased agility by 14% and also um, uh, improved the balance, the balance um, with a decrease in number of falls by 9%. Additionally, after 16 weeks, um, team and ball group show a significant higher agility scores than the control group. So, preliminary results show that recreational team handball has positive effects on body mass, body composition, bone health and physical fitness of postmenopausal women, counteracting uh, some uh, menopause adverse effects. Thank you for your attention. I'm available for questions. Yes. Okay, so I think the uh, technical issue has resolved, has been resolved. Thank you. Now it works, so th that is nice. Uh, and I'm here to present uh, also something, uh, some studies about team handball and uh, the health effects of team handball. And it's also a part of the handball for health. Um, in this presentation, I will uh, go more deeper into uh, handball training in overweight, untrained women. Uh, and uh, have found out that there is no need for prior, prior experience to improve physiological outcomes. Uh, 
doesn't work, I think this one. <laughs> okay, do this. Okay, I published uh, uh, three original articles uh, with my group in uh, Copenhagen. And the first one is uh, where we investigated the health effects uh, of 12 weeks of uh, team handball in young untrained women. Um, and we did the same for young adult men in study two. And the third study, we uh, studied their physiological outcomes uh, in overweight untrained women. And what we found was that compared to controls, team handle training showed positive effects on VO2 max. I think it's easier not to use this one. I'll speak loud. Oh, I have to use it. Okay. Because it's... Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> um, I'll kick. Look down here, I think. Yeah, I start all over. Compared to controls, team handle training showed positive effects on VO2 max. Um, but not for young women, body composition and proximal female bone mineral density. And there was no need for prior team handball experience to adapt to training. And compared to controls, parameters for motivation and well-being were, were increased in young adult women. And uh, so why? So why team handball? Yeah different kind of exercise may attract and motivate different people. There's been most extens extensive uh, research in recreational football uh, and it has shown, as you said earlier, um, that we have seen the, a broad spectrum of physiological health effects and uh, it seems that rec recreational football uh, is an easy game for beginners. So. Um, Every, everybody can play, so that's uh, that's important. Um, team handball is a popular popular sport in Denmark and Europe, and uh, the Danish Handball Federation organized a new way to play team handball. Um, as seven against seven is a technical and tactical demanding game format for beginners. We did some pilot studies. And it showed that there are high intensity during club training in four versus four team handball. So based on this, we came up with three randomized control studies. So yeah, study one and two with the young women and men. And study three, we also evaluated the physiological effects of 16 weeks of team handball in overweight women. And we uh, investigated uh, our primary outcome was VO2 max. We looked at body composition, muscle mass, fat mass, and fat percentage, bone mineral content and density, burn turnover markers, cardiovascular risk, ra risk markers as cholesterol, blood pressure, yo-yo uh, performance, and echo. So why overweight elderly untrained women? They are not post-menopausal uh, women, but they are in the age from 35 to 50 years old. It was to investigate women with a more vulnerable uh, cardiovascular risk profile. Um, and because football fitness has especially been a success among women, and an extra dimension were that we, we studied if um, if there were different in the physiolo physiological, physiological outcomes uh, comparing if you are inexperienced uh, compared to, to uh, experienced. So uh, we had some inclusion and exclusion criteria. It's not that important here, I think, so I'll move on. Uh, we had baseline test and uh, the adherence to training were 1.6 per week in the unexperienced group and also for the experienced group. Um, 10 to 12 minutes warm up and uh, we had four games of 10 minutes per training session. So that it's in total 40 minutes of play and we had some 
post post uh, test and um, and we can see that the games yeah consisted of three versus three and four versus four so it's not you know like normal handball where you uh, have uh, have the same goalkeeper actually we uh, the goalkeeper was always attacking so you were they were playing one plus in the attack actually so we had short di duration attacks which should potentially increase the time spent on running so i have the results here um, first you can see uh, i have the flow for the study i think the most important to tell you right here is that we ended up after 16 weeks of testing with the 13 subjects in the, in the unexperienced group and 10 in the ex experience group and in the control group um, we ended up with nine so what you can see here is that for study one two and three their intensity were high and in study three uh, you can see both for the unexperienced and the experienced group that in 90 to 100 percent of the time uh, or i'm sorry in 90 to 100 percent of uh, maximal heart rate uh, they spend it i'm sorry <laughs> they sp <laughs> oh i'm sorry i'll try again um i haven't you can see i can't use this one can i it's more easier if i can use this one it's not no but as you can see they spent over 30 to 40 percent of the time in the highest zone the highest pulse rate zone so very high intensity and the mean heart rate ranged between 84 and 85 percent of heart rate max so um and if we move on to view to max you can see also for study three that it was only in the unexperienced group that we had a seven percent increase uh, we did not see any increase in the experience group um, and actually in study one for uh, the young the young adult girls we didn't see any increase at all but in study two for the young adult men we had a high increase in view to max so that's interesting so a higher increase uh, we did see a higher increase in the men uh, and so it's very interesting i think um, all groups had uh, an increase in yo-yo performance and as you can see the unexperienced group i'm sorry experience group they did not show any uh, increase in performance but in the inexperienced group we saw a 27 percent increase so and also for bone density and bone markers and body and body composition we saw some uh, positive changes uh, we saw uh, for study three again uh, 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 a decrement in fat percentage by 1.4 percent and for total fat mass we also saw uh, a 1.2 a decrement and and for android fat mass we also saw a decrement which is positive and um, for proximal femur density we saw an increase that's also very positive for both group actually um, the experience group did not show any positive changes uh, changes on but bone mass on I'm sorry on body composition and muscle um, mass so uh, injuries and adherence uh, we did not show um, we did not have any injuries uh, yeah we had one one broken finger out of 28 participants to begin with uh, the injury rate 
um, is less in these studies and in this study uh, with our overweight women because uh, in elite handball we see that there is 1.5 per match and it's caused by physical, physical uh, contact uh, the most of the, the, the injuries. And the adherence, we recommended twice a week, and as you can see, they had 1.6 uh, training sessions per week. So that was slower that, than we expected. Um, but today, they are still playing, and that's fantastic. Two years after the study has finished, they are still playing. So that's re really, really great, I think. So overall conclusion and relevance, we showed positive effects on view to max body composition and bone mineral density um, for the unexperienced group. And for the experienced group, we only showed uh, positive changes on bone uh, mineral density. So why is this important findings? Um, View to max is uh, a low view to max is associated to premature death, um, and as you can see, uh, for the inexperienced group, uh, they had a, a, a positive change in android fat mass, and it's uh, really strong associated with the cardiovascular cardiovascular risk factors. So um, that's really good. On the bones, uh, we saw, as I said before, uh, positive changes uh, on both in, in both the inexperienced and the experienced group. And it's easier if I could have this one to show you, but I can't. But as you can see in the figure, um, when you start exercising, um, you will <laughs> you will have a higher bone mass, and if you stop exercising, your bone mass will fall, and the degradation process will, f will fall uh, faster. Uh, if you're still exercising, you can delay this degradation process. So, um, and as you know, every third woman will have osteoporosis at some point, so, um, I think it's really good um, results, and uh, normally uh, it takes three to four months, maybe even longer, to see positive changes in BMD, and we showed it here uh, after only three to four months. So um, it would be very interesting to 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 have a longer duration. Uh, maybe six months, one year, to see if we could have even more pronounced uh, changes. So, when we're taking into account that small-sided team handball has shown to be motivating and joyful in study one, combined with low injury rate, it may be a useful tool in the reduction of morbidity and mortality. Perspective. <laughs> this is. Um, if I can recommend a team, oh, small sided team handball, yeah, for sure. Um, but we need future research in, in this area. So, and especially if, if we want to strengthen implement, implementation and optimization of physiological outcomes, I think um, we showed that. Minimal of experience is not an issue in the time of this game format, but what about the dose response? Should we have a higher volume or frequency? And what about the pit size? Uh, as I told you before, we didn't see, um, we saw changes, positive changes in to max on the women's uh, in study three in the overweight women in study threes, but only for the uh, inexperienced group. And if you compare with football, uh, 
football has shown that uh, to to have to have a um, to, to has shown to to have a higher increase in to max for 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 women uh, playing football for three to four months so maybe if we um, even though the pulse were high the heart rate was high in this study with overweight women um, maybe uh, the field was too small because maybe they did too much static work and I think that we should investigate this in the future to, to see does it matter because when we look at the heart rate it doesn't matter we s but, but other factors can, can play a role um, so that's really important and of course the long term effects um, these studies only give a brief picture so that's also important and the uh, interesting research uh, would be research in participants with osteopenemia and osteoporosis actually uh, because um, in all my studies I have showed positive effects on, on this area and, um, and as, as I said uh, only three to four months and that's that's very positive yeah so thank you for your attention so mm -hmm. any questions thank you Teresa So our next speaker is Carmen Georgi from Romania. And uh, she's gonna tell us about the impact of a top player injury on Romanian national handball team performance uh, during the France uh, EHF uh, Euro in 2018. or another name for this presentation is why Romania didn't win. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Carmen, I came from uh, Romania. I'm a PhD student and also a former player for the national team. And as a funny fact, on, on Wednesday when I was uh, coming here at the airport, I met with the national team, which I studied in my paper. And I met with my former colleagues, with my coach, and I was talking about them, uh, about my paper, and they were like, what? you did this <laughs> how was it and I I told them uh, about the results and they were very surprised 
they didn't expect someone to make uh, this uh, study. So this can be um, a surprising fact for me. They didn't know about this and they should have known. So let me tell you about uh, my, uh, our study. Uh, firstly, I would like to remind you some of the highlights from the HF Euro 2018. Uh, France f uh, f hosted for the first time a uh, European Championship and won for the first time the European Championship. The second highlight was that uh, this edition was the most uh, broadcasted edition of all times with 2,749 hours of broadcasting with an uh, almost 40% over the previous uh, edition. Uh, the next highlight was that the wings players scored uh, more goals than the backcourt players. This was a record. Um, uh, and this can be explained by the fact that uh, handball is becoming uh, faster and faster. Uh, and that brings us to the um, next highlight. Uh, when uh, Christina Nagu broke the record for the most goals ever scored, outperforming uh, Hungarian player Agnes Farkas. Um, Agnes uh, told in an int interview uh, after the competition that she was e expecting this to happen because um, uh, in a game nowadays uh, we see many, many, many uh, goals scored. Uh, so the timeline performance of Romanian team, I can tell you about that uh, Romania has a constant presence. They uh, were here uh, from 1994, the first edition of the Euro Championship, and their best result um, was in 2010 when they won the bronze medal. Since then, the next edition, they uh, ended up on 10th place uh, because they are in a, a transition pe period, and we can see uh, we can see here that uh, with time uh, the team gets better, uh, the group uh, cohesion is getting better and the results are getting be better. After the um, uh, last edition in 2016, everyone is expected Team Romania to win a medal, but they ended in uh, first place, which is said to be the um, more, uh, most disappointing place, uh, losing the medal. Uh, in what personal achievement is concerned, um, we can, um, uh, I can uh, tell you about um, four players with uh, great performances. Uh, Christina Nagu, the backcourt, uh, ended up uh, the third and top scorer with 44 goals. Uh, she was uh, the second best defender by average and um, as I told you before, the player with the most goals ever scored. The line player, Krina Pinta, ended up 10th in top player scorers and uh, in all-star team uh, awarded with best pivot um, trophy. Eliza Buciski, the center back, uh, ended up uh, second in top scorer and the goalkeeper, Yulia Dumanska, nominated for player for the year. Um, now I would like to uh, talk to you about the team performance. Uh, so for uh, this, uh, we uh, recorded the indicators from the um, European uh, handball uh, website. Um, and we calculated the um, uh, standard math mathematical uh, like mean and percentages. Uh, so uh, we can hear in the table here the values recorded for recorded for the, uh, position attacks and fast breaks in the eight matches. Um, I highlighted the game against Hungary because uh, this game was the key moment when uh, Christian, uh, when the uh, left back player, the most valuable player, of the team got injured in minute 52 of the game. So uh, here we can see in uh, in the blue light uh, the total goals per attacks indicator. Uh, in the yellow the goals per position and the goals for fast breaks in uh, red in uh, color. Uh, so. Um, in the first three matches, uh, we can see an, um, uh, um, 
a good performance above the average of 50% of efficiency. Um, uh, the first three matches uh, were won. And then they have a drop down in the match against Netherlands. This was explained by the fact that the team was tired. Um, and then they had again a rise. And in the game against Hungary, the overall team performance was above average. Uh, and they performed good, but until minute fi 52. Uh, they uh, lost this game by two goals margin. But they uh, managed to qualify in the semifinals uh, due to an, um, uh, another match, Netherlands against Germany. Uh, so this is how they went in the semi-finals. Um, uh, even though they lost this game, this wasn't their biggest loss. The, their biggest loss was the injury suffered by their most valuable player. After this game, we can see the, here a drop in evolution in, in efficiency, 42% and 33% uh, in efficiency. Um, uh, an important information here is that 91% um, of the um, uh, goals uh, were scored by position attacks, and only 9% of the goals was, were recorded by were, were scored by fast breaks. This can be explained by the fact that uh, the team strategy was uh, oriented towards uh, bringing forward the backwards, especially the left back, uh, which is a great player with a great capacity of thinking over the game, playing one-on-one, -on -one, two on 2 situation, and of course throwing from a far distance. Um, the next slide shows you in the table the uh, most uh, relevant indicators, the goals per shots and goals per attacks. Uh, and uh, the mean uh, efficiency uh, for shooting f and uh, attacks. So we have uh, 57 percent average shooting efficiency, 50 percent uh, average attacks efficiency, and we can see in the first three matches here uh, the team have had a good evolution above average. These games were won. Then they had that drop down I was talking to you about uh, before, and then they began uh, began to rise again. And in the game against Hungary, this is the key moment. The field the players had a good efficiency rate above average but then as you can see they had a dramatic decrease in efficiency um, uh, with the 33 percent in the semi uh, in the small final against the Netherlands so uh, the field players were were only downhill from there uh, in what uh, goalkeepers uh, is concerned, you can see here a different situation. In the first five matches, they recorded a good efficiency above average, but in the match against Hungary here, they recorded their lowest efficiency rate. Unlike the field players uh, who recorded a good efficiency rate. So here, uh, after the match against Hungary, the goalkeepers kept rising. It was uphill for, for the goalkeepers. Um, so, as conclusions, the first one was that uh, the uh, absence of a fundamental player uh, affected the team play structures, especially in attack phases, without having any negative effects on goalkeepers. The second one was that Romanian players experienced a me mental block uh, and they would have needed more time to recover um, just to, to tackle the next uh, two matches and the more, more most important ones. The emotional imbalance and weakened shape were the main factors that uh, prevented the team from not winning a, a medal in this championship. And the last conclusion is that um, coaches should have um, alternative technical and tactical strategi strategies so that uh, they come s can substitute the absence of one or more fundamental players in any moment of the game, uh, especially in major competitions. Thank you very much.
you have questions. Um, I have one question. Um, have you compared the injury rates to previous championships uh, for, the for the Romanian team and looked at if there was something um, uh, abnormal in the rate of injuries or? No, but it would be uh, a topic. For yeah. And, it, and it, it comes to show that it's not only about the number of injuries, it could be one injury that could change the whole picture for for a team and it can apply for a season as well not just a short tournament so um, our next speaker is Marina Giard uh, from Russia from Moscow talking about differences in attention attributes for female handball players And now I want to speak about some another aspects of training of handball players. Before we listen many about injuries, about physical fitness, about uh, physical preparation, but now I hope to speak a little bit on our things. Because, uh, for example, uh, coach who work with uh, young players, not uh, elite players, with young players, with middle level players, sometimes she one problem. Players is very nice physical preparedness, tactical, technical, everything is okay. But sometimes some players not uh, demonstrate full efficiency and coach thinking what is it, which problem. And uh, so we decide to see one problem because we work with young uh, national team for girls 18, 19. And coach same have problem and we decide to see little bit some subject for psychological problems and some attentional, attentional qualities of uh, our players. Uh, as you know, uh, the number of objects that can uh, be can be captured in the shortest period of time normally is four or, or six. For example, is goalkeeper, defender, part of field, where is now is a player, ball, partners, only this. But uh, during attacking action, handball players must include for, he, for his attention near to 12 objects. Five is partners, or six of them you have change of goalkeeper, six field players, goalkeeper of opposi opposing team, and the ball. In defense, the handball players also need to control movements of all players, of partners, part, uh, moving of ball, moving of uh, partners and uh, movement of uh, opponent teams which way go. So, we is uh, attention have many abilities and uh, we now see from this big volume only for the most important for us now intensity and concentration of attention. Uh, we take 26 handball players, age 18, 19 years old, and uh, we make one very simple test. You have one list of Zion, and uh, four minute players, row by row, need to find one, two, two, two Zion. One uh, Zion, for example, need line this way, second Zion this way. And we control every one minute, and uh, all test is only four minutes, and after we have this characteristic and you see volume of attention of players and after we see which position is good or not good and have or not have differences. As you see, volume of attention is different for players of different position. The best is of course center back because this special uh, position where player is must see every scene where is better give pass, where is uh, most efficient situation for attack. So, and uh, in second place is left wings. We little bit surprised, but a uh, little bit less conditions you have goalkeepers. Because uh, normally, especially when a uh, team is in defense, goalkeeper must see every field, 
movement of his defenders, movement of ball, and see and prognose which attack position we will be. But this uh, means for us all will be surprise. So, uh, the most interesting after see some another characteristic, for example, we see that uh, center back for concentration have not too much of surprise. But for full volume is this. Uh, after we count a special attention accuracy index, and uh, again, is the best you have left wings and of course back full in black players. Uh, full position is left and right back and center back. And uh, surprise with pivot linear liner players, same is not too much, but uh, is surprise same because Normally, this position is very special role because need to control movement, control partner, and do it pass for, for finish attack of team. So, and after, uh, we see clear performance because uh, when people make this test, sometimes, of course, some people have mistake, put not this line or don't see some sign. Of course, after we see uh, clear performance and if you see is the most is uh, again back players uh, and so the most line is uh, pivots and after uh, we count is pace how much signals in one minute is in middle average make players of every position same of course is the best speed is a uh, center back players because for speed for work with information is the best with this position. And again, left wings in second row. And so, after uh, we decide for control intensity of attention, how much attention is uh, have stability or go up or go down for players of every position. Same, if you see every position, goalkeeper first minute 274.5 Zion in one minute second minute little bit more this minute near to same and uh, last minute is start to more so uh, if you see dynamics dynamic is go up so you means that attention is uh, for this player uh, this position player so is need to Sometimes before exercise must have little bit more special training exercise. Pivots, you see tendency down, up, up, not stability. Center back is the best situation because from one to four minutes, if every time speed of uh, work with information is go up. So this intensity is more best and these players we see is very nice and this girl some after competition have MVP of uh, Euro Championship. Then left wings position is from 292 to 310, little bit less and after down. So dynamic is this way. Right wings same is champion situation and little bit more up in, in uh, finish of test. And back players, same you see, is go to down, чуть-чуть up, little bit up, and after again down. So, uh, coach, when see this uh, database, understand for, for what some players don't work. And after, start to, including for warm-up to when it's have ex special exercise with ball, uh, increase ball, for one play not with two ball, three ball, four ball, and give, for example, have one interesting exercise, we want make uh, girls uh, some exercise to coach, assistant, stay, and show some play with number, and go girls near after to, to speak with which number she see. So, for make little bit, for increase volume of this quality. So, and uh, in this uh, figure, you can see same is a uh, different speed of player, po of player positions. So is a uh, center back, of course, is uh, especially with employ of uh, handball players, is must be is special. And ex especially is, is possible interpret this because for good selection for this, this position. And so 
function is uh, increase with attention because it must be every time quickly, 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 and so after these people demonstrate and test these uh, results. And after, of course, need to understand which exercise need to put for training session and after these conditions, but it's better to start not, of course, 18, 19 years old, because now we make experiment for experience with girls, uh, of course, 10, 12 is the best time, but if you have no possibilities, of course, it's better, but it's need to work every time and especially parallel with exercise for coordination. Thank you for attention. Any questions? I'm, um, I'm very happy to see your data because it explains a lot. During my playing career, I used to always think that whenever a, a goal was scored on me, it was the goalkeeper's fault. So now I know it's the truth. And whenever I pass to the line player and he didn't catch it, I used to blame them. So thank you for uh, validating my, uh, my thoughts. So the next uh, speaker, Linda, from the Netherlands, would talk about the evaluation of ankle bracing in female youth uh, handball talents. Okay, um, I'm going to tell you something about the project we did in the Netherlands with uh, ankle bracings. First of all, what about the ankle? You look at the black, the, the girl in the black. I think everyone has seen what happened. Twisted her ankle. Um, at the, in the Netherlands we try to evaluate all injuries and when we look at our group with 21 uh, handball talents who were all born in uh, the zeros or uh, for, uh, 2002, uh, 2001, we saw a, quite a large rate of ankle injuries. We followed them during two seasons, and you see in the first season there were only seven of those 21 uh, girls who didn't have an ankle injury. And in the second se season again there were only seven girls uh, of the whole team who didn't have an ankle injury. And I think most important, all, uh, 10 girls already had an ankle injury in the previous season, and it's always uh, it's known uh, that when you had an ankle injury, risk for having another injury is quite high. So when we look back at those two seasons, we noticed that only two talents of the complete group of 21 girls 
didn't have an ankle injury. So we had a lot of ankle injuries in this group. And um, when you look at the time loss, so the time that they couldn't, weren't able to train or uh, play matches, we had a lot of time loss. So we looked at the literature, and literature is quite um, uh, uh, straight about this, and says, well, bracing is the best part, or the best thing to do when you want to prevent ankle injuries. So we decided to uh, take a better look at it and to see if it's really working for our uh, talent as, as well. So again, we went to the first group, uh, the 21 female handball uh, talents uh, who were already following for two years. Um, the ones that had a history of ankle injuries, we told them to use an ankle brace or tape. Some of them were already doing it, but we advised them all to do it. And next to that, we had another group uh, born in 2002 and 2003, and this group we said, well, we want all of this group, whether if you had, whether if you've had ankle injuries or not, we want the complete group to start using preventive bracing or tape. In the first group, those were the results from the first two years, so a lot of injuries, and then this is the third season, the season where most of the group were, was wearing ankle braces. And now you see there are 21 girls, there are 14 girls who didn't have an ankle injury in during this season. Then the other group, the younger group, uh, we only saw five injuries during one season, so that's a big difference in compared to the other groups in the first two seasons. And also the time loss was way less than in the other, uh, in the other group in the first two seasons. What does it tell us? Well, ankle injuries are a serious problem in Dutch female handball players, especially in this age. Um, the bracing policies uh, that we've changed seems to have a positive influence on prevalence and time loss, but for sure further needs, uh, research is needed. And we've got some problems to solve because especially in the younger girls, a lot of girls say, well, I don't have ankle injuries, so why do I have to wear braces? And uh, we try to explain them and show them the details that uh, we've seen in the project so far to, to make sure that they will be wearing their braces. But there are also some parents who say, well, if my kid starts wearing braces at this age, the ankle will be weaker. Uh, literature, literature at this moment says it isn't, but these are some problems that we're facing at this moment. So that's my uh, project. Are there any questions? Yes? I have a question or a comment. Well, what do you do with uh, the players who start uh, wearing uh, braces, braces all the time? So in the future, they will play all their life with uh, braces? Um, at least well, as long as they play on this higher level, yes, we advise them to keep on playing, wearing the bla braces, yes. Latest, latest, latest studies show that bracing beats balance board, so bracing, yes. They are, they are, they are training as well, but they did the training before, uh, um, 
in in the previous two series, three, uh, the previous two seasons, they were training as well. So it's not that they don't do any training; they do. But besides the training, they wear a brace as well. And latest literature does say that bracing is better than the training, than pure training. The mus muscles are still there, the brace is just a support, an extra support. There, there is, there is a lot of discussion about this, and I think there, there will be a lot of discussion in the future as well. But this is, uh, th this is uh, one of the articles we were looking at, and this is giving some good results on bracing, and that's why we decided to do this project. And well, results so far are good. So, no, no, we just. At this moment, we just started looking what will happen. So we were just we were we were evaluating uh, injuries during all, all injuries, even uh, knee injuries and other injuries. Um, but the problem is, well, we had a lot of players who couldn't play. So that's why we said, okay, at this age, when we have in a group of 21 young adult uh, young players, we've got only two players left who didn't have an ankle injury. We have to try to do something about it. So that's that's the reason why we started this study. But it's, it's just a small study at this moment, it's, or it was just a small study, and we try to uh, look for the future, try to... Uh, So um, we can we can see this topic is uh, creating a, a lot of debate, which is good. This is what we want, and this is uh, this is this is a, a basis for future uh, studies. I mean, this debate on using braces and uh, uh, developing strategies to reduce uh, lower limb injuries and especially ankle um, sprains, because they're um, uh, probably the most common injury or or time loss injury. In uh, in handball, uh, it's been going on for years.
So are, so are you so are you for or against braces? I, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I, I agree, and I think uh, it, it's not, you know, it's not one solution. And for for certain teams, it, it, you know, one solution might be better than for another team. Uh, there's also the concept which, for many years, we relied on that there is a uh, an issue with the interface between the playing shoes and the surface. Now, the majority of these studies have been done uh, two decades ago where the, co the handball courts were completely different. But now, there uh, are new products that are being developed and there are new studies that some of them are already published on uh, um, uh, the type of uh, shoes and uh, sole material that can alter uh, these uh, mechanics and interface between shoes and courts, and they may have an effect on on uh, on injuries as well. So there are many many uh, aspects to to this problem, and I think that's the, the the conclusion is yes, we need to keep investigating, and it might not be just one solution. Why not try both? I think that's the most important point. It is it is an. A, mo a, a really common uh, injury in handball, so we need to have more information about this. Okay, thank you. So, uh, moving forward to our last speaker, coming all the way from Poznan in Poland, uh, Jakub Stefaniak uh, from uh, the RIA Sport uh, Group. Uh, will talk to us about recovery after arthroscopic treatment of posterior instability. Is it um, shoulder instability? Okay. So yeah, so, so we know that uh, in the meantime, I'll just uh, say a few words. We know that uh, recovery after shoulder surgery in handball is, uh, um, is a big issue and a big problem. Um, and um, it's a long rehabilitation. Uh, getting back to an overhead uh, contact throwing sport after surgery is very, very challenging. So um, Jakub is going to tell us how it's easy and possible. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm orthopedic surgeon from Raha Sports Clinic in Poznan, in Poland. Uh, I would like to present uh, the problem about recovery after arthroscopic treatment of posterior shoulder instability. Firstly. I would like to present what is the posterior instability. It occurs in 2 to 10 percent of all shoulder instability. It uh, um, occurs in young um, population from 20 to 30 years old. And uh, the recurrent posterior instability, maybe, uh, often that it's uh, present uh, in 50 percent after uh, to trauma. It's uh, mostly discrete and occasionally as a result of uh, first time traumatic dislocation. The etiology it's after trauma, sport, laxity of the uh, capsule uh, and ligaments, volition, psychogenic, postural uh, or dyskinesis of the shoulder and scapula. Uh, it occurs common in weightlifters and overhead uh, athletes. Uh, the classification, we've got mm, traumatic dislocations, the first time dislocation, which lead to the recurrent uh, uh, shoulder instability, posterior shoulder instability. Sometimes it's chronic when the, sh the dislocation shoulder is locked. And the second part is recurrent posterior subluxation. It's involuntary after trauma of uh, in the eff effect of hyperlaxity or both hyperlaxity and trauma. And the pathology of uh, this posterior shoulder instability may occur of, uh, uh, in soft tissue, or like reverse bone cartusions, uh, the injuries of uh, the ligaments, the posterior chondrolabral erosion uh, of the glenoid rim, or increased joint, uh, joint uh, volume. And the bone uh, uh, pathologies like increased uh, glenoid retroversion, posterior glenoid uh, erosion uh, on engaging humeral head uh, defects. Uh, 
the history of uh, the clinical picture is repetitive uh, sub uh, shoulder subluxations, subtle uh, sim uh, symptoms like pain in provocative arm position, and flexion, abduction, and internal rotation, lost control, uh, control of uh, arm on throwing, following uh, ball release, and it's uh, specific for uh, sports, uh, especially for uh, handball uh, uh, and handball players. Uh, sometimes traumatic event and violation. Uh, in clinical picture, we assess uh, the range of motion. We should check the uh, is, is there any scapular dyskinesis here. You've got on this film, maybe once again. Or hyperlaxity of the joints, uh, like in the, on this uh, movie, the hyperlaxity of the shoulder joint. Next part is examination, the, uh, the positive provocative tests. Uh, sometimes patients uh, present, uh, demonstrate the instability by himself. Provocative tests like jerk test or uh, posterior apprehension test. In jerk test, we can check the clank when we uh, uh, adduct the uh, the arm in the horizontal position, horizontal plane. In the imaging in the uh, Magnetic resonance, uh, uh, we, we can find a, a lot of uh, uh, labla regions uh, like Polpsa, Bankart, Kims, uh, or other like Osos Bankart, uh, and uh, uh, defects uh, uh, in the uh, humeral head like uh, reverse uh, Hilzak uh, sign. And in our uh, study, we mm, focus on the uh, operative uh, treatment, uh, which is uh, indicated if there is decrease of function due to pain or instability of the shoulder, the, pa uh, the patient is physically stable, and there is no improvement after conservative treatment. And uh, the op operative treatment has better results if uh, this post-traumatic or there are some bone defects. All patients have the same protocol uh, of the rehabilitation. The rehabilitation starts next day after surgery. First four weeks uh, the patient use sling and after that uh, it starts with the uh, uh, progressive straightening uh, and uh, um, uh, rehabilitation to improve the range of motion. And the aim of the study was to evaluate the recovery uh, of range of motion and uh, isometric parameters in patients after uh, or arthroscopy, uh, arthroscopic posterior uh, uh, instability. Uh, Inclusions criteria, only patients with posterior shoulder instability, with no recurrence, no apprehension, uh, and with the same pr uh, rehabilitation proco protocol, which I, we checked the range of motion of flexion, abduction, and uh, uh, external rotation. And uh, the isokinetic evaluation with the use of biobiotic system uh, with uh, isokinetic mode, uh, concentric, concentric, with modified seated and scapular plane. Material was composed of 19 athletes, operated in 2016 to 2018 for posterior shoulder instability. Only one procedure, 
uh, we check the range of motion preparatively and after 14 weeks and 24 weeks after surgery. And isokinetic evaluation after 14 and 24 weeks too. In the results of range of motion, there's, there are no stat uh, statistical differences in range of motion uh, in flexion and abduction between preoperative and examination and after uh, six months. And external rotation was regained, uh, regained at, uh, after six months of the uh, rehabilitation after surgery. In the isokinetic evaluation, um, the peak torque, the, which means the, the strength of uh, the strength of the uh, muscles. There are statistical differences between uh, um, external rotation, uh, strength of the external rotation um, of operated uh, shoulders uh, between. 14 and uh, uh, 24 uh, weeks after surgery, and uh, the same for internal rotation. The ratio, which means that the, the muscle balance between internal rotators and external rotators, uh, and the uh, uh, the ratio uh, was uh, the value of the rate was uh, 64 uh, percent uh, after 14 and uh, the similar for after 24 weeks, um, but we have to uh, uh, there is no significant differences between these uh, these examinations, but we have to remember the proper rate in this position of uh, the upper limb is 68 to 78 uh, uh, percent. So that means that we have to improve the strength of the uh, external uh, uh, muscles, uh, uh, center rotation uh, muscles. Total work, which means that, uh, which means that endurance of the, uh, of the muscles, there is no significant differences. Um, between uh, um, first and second uh, uh, examination after surgery. And average power uh, of the muscles, uh, there are there is significant differences for uh, in operated uh, shoulders uh, 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 in external rotation. Uh, for internal rotation in, uh, Operated shoulder. There's the difference too. It's uh, uh, the the, uh, the power uh, is, is higher in uh, after four, uh, 24 weeks, but there's no significant differences. Uh, but it means that um, at this stage, patient has no fear of moving uh, uh, with uh, with a shoulder uh, with high speed. This uh, study was, uh, um, th this examination was performed with the uh, highest uh, angular uh, speed of Biodex. To conclude, uh, full strength and range of motion recovery is possible uh, with, uh, uh, within six months after uh, surgery in patients with posterior shoulder instability. Isokinetic evaluation is good um, to uh, test, uh, to uh, evaluate the basic parameters of tested muscles. We have significant improvement of strength and power of operated limbs. And uh, uh, this kind of evaluation is helpful, uh, helpful for proper planning and supervision of rehabilitation process and training. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you, Jakub. So I think um, it emphasizes that uh, shoulder injuries, especially instability, which are not very common uh, in, ha in handball, but when they do occur, they require a long period of time away from sports and a long rehabilitation. So um, best to try and avoid them. And there are some programs uh, out there in, uh, in the last two years showing uh, um, injury prevention programs for uh, shoulder um, injuries as well. Thank you. 
Okay, so I think uh, we're done with this session. I want to thank all the speakers and everyone who uh, came to listen to these interesting talks. And um, um, if you have further questions, please exchange details, feel free. I think there are some interesting uh, topics and questions uh, raised here, so good luck.